Bonjour, and welcome to episode 10 of Cooking with Grief, the podcast where we attempt to distract ourselves and you from the unrelenting call of the void by discussing all that is great, good, and downright weird in the world. My name's Chris, and as ever, I'm joined by my partner in victimless crime, Chris. Hello, I am your criminal sidekick. Eh, I wouldn't say sidekick, I'd say we're equal partners. Good, it's equally culpable for this audible bank robbery. Yes. I don't want to go down as the ringleader. <laughs> if I go down, I'm taking you with me. Good message, terrible wedding vow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, how are you? I'm okay. It's exciting. You know, the big one oh. Ten years of doing this show. Yeah, ten years. That's what it feels like. Time's certainly passing and we're still doing this. We should clarify for any uh, listeners in the future that this has not been going on for ten years at this particular stage no we, we don't we don't release one a year and it's it's like a, <laughs> a big spectacle like i know a solar eclipse or something although you shouldn't look directly at us that is true so how, how are you how are you celebrating the big one oh uh not at all i think that's that's about right if anything that feels extravagant yeah just calling it one oh instead of episode 10 I <laughs> sorry I, I brought too much flair to it as always i'm sorry i could call it episode x like a sort of a special after hours un- yeah. under the covers cooking with grief i was thinking more like the 10th installment of friday the 13th but uh yeah either works both are neither, terrible neither ideas works, that is- Let's just have a quick reminder of the format. So, as ever, we've each brought with us today two topics to share that uh, have tickled our interest, which we will then almost immediately discard to talk about bodily fluids. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that's the usual format. We'll get sperm out of anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a terrible slogan. Again, a terrible wedding vow. <laughs> well, before we do that, have you got a Kurt Russell fact for this week, please? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> the uh, pre-record production meeting <laughs> could have been tighter. <laughs> that would have been so easy to check before we hit record. Oh, uh, yeah, we should, we should have. Well, okay, I'll do my first <laughs> bit of nonsense then. Let's go. All right, so for my first topic, I see, Chris, what's the weirdest thing you've ever found? I found shitloads of porn in the woods, but then you find out that that's uh, that actual normal thing to find for some bizarre well, reason. Well, it used to be. Yeah, it used to be. May have just shown my age there. But that's nothing compared to what a fisherman in Siberia found in March of 2018. So this dude was walking along alongside the Amur River in the southeastern Russian city of Khabarovsk, and he finds a bag containing 27 pairs of severed human hands. Were they paired as in there was a left and a right hand, or were they just... 54 pairs of hands. Who has mismatching hands? I can't do that. I don't know. Just ask him what's in the bag. <laughs> it's much more rela- <laughs> relaxed end to seven. <laughs> oh, what's in, what's in the bag, mate? What's in the bag? Anyway, go on. So... I assume they are match- 27 matching pairs. Okay. And it's not, as you might think, a hand-obsessed serial killer. It's not. In the city, there was a forensic laboratory that just didn't dispose of its waste properly. Just... Littered them. Just chuck the hands in a bag, chuck it in the river. That seems like terrible. Surely, as forensic scientists, however, they sort of aware of what happens to body parts and stuff, and be like, "Yeah, this is this is just going to wash up somewhere, and someone's going to find it." Well, you know, it's. I, I think like a lot of these places might have good practices. Like at work, for example, we've got um, twenty seven you know, like pairs like, of human hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a and as soon as I work in a bakery, then. It's a really, uh, really big health hazard. But no, like at like at work, we've got like a big bin that's like segmented for like general rubbish and like bottles and ones for like cardboard and stuff. Is there a section for human remains? There's not. As it, well, it, there's f- food waste which might cover that. But you take the, take the lid off that's like separating it all, and it's all just one big bag that you end up chucking there. So it's the illusion of of recycling. So maybe it's like that sort of thing. Like that is so they've pointless. just chucked. You know, it's so pointless. But that's what the modern working life is it's finding pointless maxims and things to look ethically good while being a massive corporation nice mm, or just disheartening in general mm. but but you know you can you can imagine you know like maybe they've closed up you know they thought right we need to get these you know just stick their hands in a bag you know cleaner comes in after everyone's left thinks ah oh, i can't be bothered sorting through all the recycling just bung it in ends up in a river it's still very disturbing like, I wonder how you react if you find that. I mean, unless they were marked, this is clearly the property of a forensic lab. You'd be rather freaked out. And also be terrified that they're going to start moving, like, uh, in the Adams family. 
There must be something in a horror film, like some some creature that's just composed of hands. Oh, just a load of hands. Just a load, just a big sort of You'd blob so. of hands. Uh, I can't think of any, though. But it... And if not, we'll get to work on a script. Yeah. One day, Hollywood, one day. The most terrifying handshake you'll ever experience. To be honest, there's a film about a tyre that chases people and kills them, so I'm pretty sure that hands would be way down the list of stupidest ideas. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if you're on to film four of the Sharknado franchise, then, yeah, you can get away with anything. What would you call it? Um, Feeling hands it. it. Makes it sound sort of creepy, but not like a horror <laughs> film, just more like a manifestation of your least favourite co-worker who gets a bit handsy in the supply cupboard. Mm. For example, yeah, that sounds oddly specific. Sorry, I don't, I can't afford a therapist, <laughs> and this is the closest thing I I get to that. I live in a small village in England, and it's like the the only two topics of conversation between semi strangers are you, the weather. If, if you say seven hands, and, I'm going to be so surprised. <laughs> and and severed hands. Oh, m- morning, Chris. Isn't it unseasonably warm? It is. Even though it's summer, it is unseasonably warm. Also, I found all these severed hands. Did you, Mrs. Wilkinson? That is horrifying. I wish there was a film about it. Me too. What would he be called, Mrs. Wilkinson? I don't <laughs> I know. I don't know. I don't know. You can't just invent a fictional character to talk to in the third person and hope that that'll make you come up with a title on the fly. Like, no, it's not good. Can't do it. But you know, like, pe- pe- people around here, like, complain if, like... The bins don't get, like, the wrong bin gets delivered or, like, they change the, the bin day at all, like, because they get used to it. So it's, you know, a real, real, you know, sort of focal point of village life is bin collection. People would lose their shit if someone put, you know, bags of severed hands in the the bin meant for bottles. Well, yeah, because it doesn't go there. If anything, it would go in general waste, because that's where they put, like meat that has gone off. No, that would have to be um, your brown bin, like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Garden waste. I think it, d- it depends if, if like, the hands also have rings and stuff, because you can obviously put metal in food oh, waste. Oh, well, if they've got rings, you take those to the pawnbroker. Sorry, I've clearly not thought it through. <laughs> <laughs> You've, you clearly not, know what you're talking about when it comes to finding bags of, of severed hands. We make it a French film and call it Man Eater. It wasn't worth the wait. Oh, right, I've dug myself a hole do you want to do your topic, first topic? Yeah, I think he- it, please help, you've dug your help. own hole and now I'm going to shoot you in the back of the head and <laughs> cover you up and leave you in the desert. I totally understand <laughs> and thank you for such a caring end. So that's my first topic over and done with. Chris, what's your first one for us? We've been doing this podcast, as you said now, nine previous times. For ten years. Well, yeah, one a year, like the Super Bowl. What would you say is your least favourite part of producing these episodes uh having to hear my own voice back when i'm editing because I, I thought i sounded um well i don't know what i thought i sounded like but turns out what i actually sound like is whiny ineffective and surprisingly camp at times and i thought i had a much more resonant commanding voice and it turns out i'm just like a yeah well you'll be uh glad or um Disappointed? <laughs> I'm covering all bases here to, to know that you are far from alone. That is not true. Well, <laughs> sorry, on this particular topic, your, your opinion is far from alone. The term for um, what you experience, and I also experience the same thing, is called voice confrontation. And scientists have sort of been trying to work out why it is that we hate the sound of our own voice so much when we hear it back. One thing that you mentioned is, to yourself, you sound lower than you do when you hear it back. So you hear your voice coming back to you, all high-pitched and nasally, and you're like, oh, what the fuck is this? Isn't it something to do with the reverberations in the jaw? Yeah, it's partly to do with that, because the um, bones conduct the low frequencies. Obviously, when you hear it back, you're not hearing it through your bones. But one of the interesting things is, is you dislike it more if you know it's you. Like, when people are played back recordings of their own voice, but randomly interspersed within different samples, so they're never entirely sure which one's them, they rate their voice on a much uh, more even scale comparative to the other voices in terms of, you know, likability and attractiveness. Um, Aren't humans weird? (laughs) Oh, yeah. The weirdest seeing yourself as a stranger thing was I once was drunk and was in a bar and went to a... And the bathroom 
just behind the door, there was a full-length mirror, and I uh, I stopped to let myself go first. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, after you. You had some devil, you can I buy you a drink? <laughs> Someone just walks in and you're just making out with a mirror. <laughs> All right, I'm not. <laughs> How low is the voice inside your head? Because you objectively have a very low voice. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Is, is it like... <laughs> Like Brian Shao Kahn in, 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 in a thunderstorm. <laughs> Gordon's alive! I, I like to demonstrate that. <laughs> your voice went higher. You put on a higher voice to demonstrate how low your voice is. <laughs> You've got a low voice. I don't, yes, I, don't. I do! <laughs> Jesus Christ, was that real? Yeah, sorry, I, I trapped myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do a really good impression of somebody on helium. You know, I've started vaping instead of smoking, but I've just switched <laughs> to a, a helium vape. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, going poorly. Kids, if you listen to this and you're trying to quit smoking, helium is a bad substitute for nicotine. I've never smoked, but I can only assume that's correct. I remember when your mum said that my voice sounds like the person you'd hear when you die and you find out you're going to hell. It's <laughs> like, cheers. Did you dream that? <laughs> yes. Oh, it would be awkward if I told <laughs> Yes, I've been dreaming about your mum. Out of context, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's where I get the uh, crippling existential t- 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 <laughs> Hi, Chris's mum, how are you? I've been dreaming of the voice you hear before death. Okay, great. We're going to play some Mortal Kombat now. You've already got quite a cool voice, but oh, thanks. if you could have any voice... To be honest, it's my accent, hearing my accent back. Because, you know, in your own head, you don't have an accent, really, that you're aware of. I've become more aware of it as I've moved to the other side of the country. Even then, I still don't feel like... So, if I do know I have an accent, it sounds stronger when I hear it back, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I sound like that. Again, to demonstrate that, you put on a different voice. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, Jesus, I, I sound to- totally... I'm so Mancunian right now. <laughs> nice shoes, those trainers. Are you right, our child? <laughs> I don't even have that much. No, it's not even... No, ne- neither of us do, but... That's the thing, it's like, it sounds not how I imagined it sounded. Yeah, but I mean, like like with you moving down south, like, at uni, I lived with all southerners, and I found myself, even though we, we lived in the north, I found myself almost, like, going more northern as a way to counterbalance living with so many southerners. Oh, uh, yeah. But it goes one of two ways. You either, like, lose your accent, becomes less prominent, or you go full, like, full rebellion. Yeah, and you come back, come back being like, you all right, all right, kid? No, oh, you all right, pal, yeah, I've been... <laughs> Mad for it! <laughs> Mad for you, ne? I'll be honest, in, like, the 20-odd years I lived in Manchester, I never once heard a single person say Mad for it, like, ever. No. Burn to think that was a lie. Well, I think it was more, it was like 90s, like, Manchester yeah, scene, wasn't true. it? So, so maybe once, um, you know, like the Hacienda, yeah, like, Hacienda glory days, days are gone. Year. I think you were going to ask me, but I'll ask you first anyway, because I rudely interrupted you. What voice would you would you take? Well, I, I don't know, just something with a bit more authority, really. Have, having having heard what I actually sound like by listening back to, to these for hours and end. Either that, like, either, either something more commanding, like a, like a northern version of Simon Callow would be nice. Or like a Kermit the Frog. Just a, <laughs> hey, hello. Yep. I just sounded like this all the time. Just Kermit the Frog. I know. I'm sort of ad-libbing uh, an impression here. I don't know if it's working. I've said to you before that it's really impossible now to tell when the news is serious and when it isn't these days because everything's fucking ridiculous. But there was an interview on the BBC News website with Kermit the Frog. Like, not with the actors behind Kermit the Frog, but literally, there was an advert with Kermit the Frog <laughs> discussing hard-hitting questions about the breakdown of his relationship with Miss Piggy. <laughs> That's the thing, if you can wake up and the, the headline is Donald Trump meets with Kim Kardashian to, to discuss prison reform, fuck it, why not? Like, yeah. I know Jeremy Paxman grills Kermit the Frog about like the trade deficit. Fuck it, who cares anymore? The world's gone to shit, let's hear from a felt frog but about the limits of free speech. Fuck it, I don't care anymore. Kermit for president. Yeah, fine. It'll be a lot better. <laughs> Four score in seven years ago. Vote <laughs> well, for me, yay! <laughs> Just imagine, like, Kermit. Miss Piggy is the first lady and, like, Gonzo is the vice president. Like, Kermit and Gonzo, like, stickers. Ozzy Bear is secretary of state. <laughs> that would be great! Compared to what we've got now, <laughs> yeah, Kermit's not going to lock kids in cages, I'm sorry. You don't know that. Oh, imagine that, like, they get in and then they become real monsters. From Muppets <laughs> to monsters. You know, the furry right takes over. 
Bye bye, Max Fry. I was going to say, if I could have any voice, I'd want like a warm voice. A warm? Warm, as in not cold. <laughs> like a warning voice, just like a siren. Just constantly. Hey, Chris, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Oh great, and all the kids. <laughs> I don't know why, I was about to take umbrage with you suggesting that I had kids. <laughs> and then I was like, what? But I was perfectly okay with me with you insinuating that I had an air well, raid. That's, that's what you were voice. saying, if you speak fluent air raid. Um, that's what you were saying, you're going, you've known me for years, I don't have kids. <laughs> but no, I wouldn't have a warning voice. Or oh, one always, but a warm voice. <laughs> I'd, voice have, like a... I'd have a warm voice, like Michael Gambon. Ian McKellen. Um, Ian McKellen, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'd love to have as a film, going back to Hollywood pictures of I've said this for years, and it's a shame because the the people I wish were in it are slowly dying off one by one. But, you know, imagine just having just like a room. You know, one of those films where it's set in like one location, Reservoir Dog style. It's just Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart and, well, I would have had John Hurt, but unfortunately he died the other year. But uh, Morgan Freeman. Just, Morgan Freeman, yeah. Just had them just chatting. <laughs> just that's it. But, but hosted by Kermit. <laughs> Talk show, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Is like, I think particularly Ian McKellen, he could read from the dictionary and it's... <laughs> It's so sumptuous. <laughs> it's an interesting adjective. Wizard! <laughs> All right, Chris, so now that we know why we hate the sound of our own voices, will you use yours to um, tell us your second topic? By the time it comes out, summer will be over, but this past summer has been hotter than average and Britons are not made for heat in any way. The UK heatwave has been exposing the outlines of ancient hill forts and settlements because modern day soil quality is still affected by Iron Age constructions. Where we haven't been able to see things like Iron Age forts and settlements before, then the sun is showing the outline of them because the grass on top of the hill... I thought you were going to say, like, the sun shines and all of a sudden an entire, like, Saxon village just appears on a hill. <laughs> well, pretty much, like, like not, like, sort of, like fully right. functioning and everything. It's not, like, rising out of the depths <laughs> yeah. of, of the earth like some sort of a Celtic zombie army. Because the, the the grass colours change the colour at a different pace in the sun. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there are... There's still like stuff underneath some of it, but not all of it. So all over the country, places that they've suspected might have things, but you know haven't like dug for them yet. We can now see exactly where they are and how big they are and stuff like that. And that means we've got a really incredible series of time team to look forward to. I always find time team so disappointing. I mean, I understand that it's like everything we sort of know about the past that wasn't like written down or handed down. Whatever it is time team style digging and finding fragments of pottery and stuff but it's just watching somebody get really excited because we found a trench and we speculate that this trench may have been the base of a wall and we found fragments of and i'm just kind of like i found a shrew skeleton yeah it's like i've seen the pyramids like nobody even had to dig those so they're just there and impressive and imposing I understand the importance of it, but it is really hard to be I mean, impressed. that's the thing. Is it's like, some episodes are great because they find what they're looking for, but when the vast majority of episodes go, we've been digging in this spot for three days and the farmer has now <laughs> stopped giving us permission to keep digging up his land. So join us next yeah. week for Time Team. when we'll, And it's like, yeah. it's it's aspirational and it's I think it's good and it's educational and I love the people on it. Mm-hmm. Um it reminds me of the thing at uh, school. Is that where you're gonna the giant yep. cock? Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's sh- let's yeah, share let's our it. massive green cock. Shall we set the scene? So every year, like there was a, a tradition of a leaver school prank. My dad actually went to the the same school that that I did, but just you know, sort of. I don't know, 20 years before it or off. A year above. <laughs> yeah. Oh. A very, oh. yeah, very strange family tree. It's a real uh, whomping willow of a, f- of a family tree. <laughs> he had stories from like Lever's pranks in his day. So it, like it had been going on, on a long time. Like they were a lot more extreme though because like they like locked the teachers in a in the staff room and like melted the locks. <laughs> so one year while we were at school, like the Lever's prank one year was to they used yeah they used bleach or something like that just something that killed the grass to make a giant penis in the middle of the cricket pitch. yeah just an enormous you know sort of 50 feet long schlongle and that was the day before the school hosted a big like sports tournament with like lots of other schools from from the area so they obviously needed a way to work around the fact that there was this massive penis burnt into the field so they decided to spray paint it but not the same colour green as the grass. So they went with a much darker green, which made the penis-like qualities of the penis 
much more <laughs> evident because before yeah. it could yeah. have just been a sort of you could justify it as a you know the grass grows sometimes the sun bleaches the grass you know it's just a, a sort of particularly phallic shape but nothing to worry about but no they went they they emphasized they, it yeah they, they brought out the the, the and then and it actually made it even worse because because they'd also burnt some other things on the grass but they didn't bother to spray paint those because they weren't as offensive and they actually disappeared within like a few months, you know, within yeah, a few yeah, months. Yeah, grass, grass regrows, and, you know, yeah. Regrown and all that. But the penis lasted a good year and a half, I think. Because <laughs> they killed the grass even more with the green paint. You know, it's the, the a history of survival in many ways that the penis endured. <laughs> so do you reckon that's come back? <laughs> Due to the hot weather. At our school, has the penis made a return or have any like Iron Age penis graffitis emerged out there? I, I was going specifically with our school, but I am willing to bet a lot of Celtic stuff probably involves schlongs. Yeah, as most civilizations <laughs> most of you do, yeah. <laughs> they did find like the world's oldest dildo is like literally like ten thousand years old. <laughs> It predates written language. It was just like, right, we don't know how to write stuff down, but by God, we know how to get ourselves off. What was it made of? Can you remember? I think it might have been stone. It does sound abrasive. Ah, yeah, but like polished. <laughs> <laughs> they learned they learn how to polish stone for dildos before they worked out what <laughs> the written language was. If, if, if aliens ever invade, that's all they need to know about these <laughs> warlike apes who have taken over the planet. I've just... Googled this because you know never do research beforehand when you do it on mm. the fly, and I actually undersold humanity because it's actually twenty eight thousand years old. Wow! And I was right; it was highly polished stone. What did they polish it with? It's also twenty centimeters long. Is that it? Oof, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> actually, wait, hold on a second. I might be getting inches and things. Tw- yeah, twenty eight yeah. inches is uh, ambitious. Yeah, seven point eight inches. It's still fair heft. Yeah, that sounds about right. Sounds. Pretty average. <laughs> <laughs> On a uh, other related note, though, they uh, somebody did draw a massive penis big enough to be seen from uh, space. I said, uh, far too many times then. <laughs> Almost like a shit Jeff Goldblum impression. Uh, penis finds uh, a way. Yeah, in uh, Australia, in a dried lake bed, somebody has made a giant penis big enough to be seen on uh, Google Maps. As a species, we are so childish. Like, uh, there's these things that hang hang down between the legs of some of the population of Earth. Ha 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 ha. You say that as if it wasn't funny. But it's so much effort, though. Like, a bottom of, like to do it on a, on a lake bed. A dried lake. It's not like you swam to the bottom. I know, but <laughs> even so, like that, that doesn't sound like it's in the middle of town. And if it's, like, got to be seen from by a satellite or whatever. But it's like, yeah. let, let's, let, let's say, like, you're around at your mates and... You come up with this idea, that's fine. After 10 minutes, you think, how committed are we to this? Because that sounds like a, like a few days be of fair, work. We don't know what crop circles are. Maybe that's aliens doing their own version of uh, dick shapes. Maybe that's like an accurate representation of an alien Wong. And they're like, we're going we're gonna to go to this planet and we're going to leave our mark and fly off into the night. Do you say Wong for penis? Yeah. Did you mean to say Wang? <laughs> it's a Wang and a Schlong. <laughs> So that was the second of my two topics, which I think originally was going to be about a very interesting topic about archaeology, but ended up going somewhere slightly uh, trousorial. Hopefully, you've got something to end uh, with a you know, so, you know something of a, a high note. Let's be honest; it has no bearing on where we end up. What topic I now bring up? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, yeah, you can talk, talk about just anything. Use this we'll is st- a uh, starting off point, anyway. A, a dick springboard. <laughs> Sounds like a porn the, fi- the, fi- the finest detective. How would you rate your work ethic on a scale of Japanese uh, water bureau workman and Spanish civil servant? Dutch bartender. Nice. How about you? Probably somewhere, somewhere in the same sort of bracket. Yeah, like a Belgian mime. I get it done, but yeah. uh, I'm not going to stress about it. Just like to compare and contrast these following stories. Over in Japan, a worker was. Uh, reprimanded for starting his lunch three minutes early. Rightly so. And I don't just mean he was reprimanded sort of in secret, and you know, not in secret, but you know, like how reprimands are usually done, sort of behind closed doors. You, know, you get 
brought into a manager's office or something. Um, the managers called a TV conference and apologised for their employees' deeply regrettable actions. <laughs> Wow, that is overkill. That wasted so much more time than the three minutes. <laughs> like, it takes yeah. so long to set up, like, cameras and they, lights for TV. They found, it wasn't a one, in fairness, it was not a one-off event. He had been found to have done it 26 times over a seven-month occasion. Oh, well, fuck him then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that's almost done an hour and a half, so <laughs> yeah, what a exactly. fucking waste of space. <laughs> How dare he? And he only did it so that he could get in the queue for lunch. You know, get to the start of the queue. Makes sense. He just then worked out how long he was away for. They uh, calculated it and then docked him that amount of pay. I wonder if he ever stayed late. Because I, I bet, like, just in sort of packing up your stuff for the day, that, you know, over over what? Over seven months, then that... He, he probably stayed an extra hour oh, and a yeah. half as well. Almost certainly. Considering the Japanese work culture, where uh, people die of overwork. And not overworking, like, being made to mind salt or something, but just sitting at an office desk, but for so long, you have heart attacks and whatnot. But uh, compare and contrast this to a uh, civil servant in Valencia, in Spain who was paid 50,000 euros a year and yet hadn't actually done a day's work for an entire decade. Oh, that's the dream. <laughs> I've, I'd, I'd like to change it. I'm, I'm much closer to that than I am the, the Japanese guy. Yeah. The thing is, he turned up every day to clock in and then he turned up like seven hours later, eight hours later and clocked out. But never in between, he just went off and did whatever he felt like. <laughs> and it was because they'd had a reorganisation. He'd ended up without any actual like superiors or subordinates so he was not sort of nobody was asking him for stuff and nobody was trying to give him stuff he made the most of it and just stopped turning up i I think is whenever i read stories like this i think fair enough if you can beat the system fine like like there was a dude in the u.s who outsourced his job like personally to a, a dude in china he was like a a software engineer and he, he came into the office every day, clocked on, and then for a fraction of his salary, he just hired a guy in China to do his work for the day and then, like, email it over. And he just, like, sort of kicked back in the office. I read one story about something similar where somebody wrote code to automate their job. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> like, But he didn't tell his superiors because they, so they thought that he was manually doing it and it was taking him eight hours a day. See, that's the, that's, that's the difference. Like, I don't want automation to cost people their jobs but if people can find a way to automate their own job within the system well yeah well that's the thing because you think about it he found a way to automate his job and kept his job if the management had found a way for him to automate his job or to automate his job and get rid of him or to only pay him those hours they'd have done it without even hesitating. So uh, on that note, I'd say this is a visual output. I'd say let's wave and try and bring it back on topic. Only it's not. It's entirely audio, so that joke would fall flat on its face. Which, again, you wouldn't be able to see. Anyway, it is goodbye from me. And it's um, something very similar from me. And we hope to see you again. Or not, because as mentioned, it's an audio medium. You really need to learn that. (laughs) Slick as trifle. Bye. Ten episodes in, I still don't know how to succinctly wrap this up. We don't look at an intro, an outro, really a middle section. It's it's just <laughs> uh, just a maelstrom of idiocy. Ooh, good word, maelstrom. Let's end on that. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cooking with Grief. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email cookingwithgrief at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. That's at Cooking With Grief. If you'd like to hear more episodes, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you've got the time, then it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you.